Hey everybody, welcome to Linux Cast. I'm your host, Matt. I'm Nate. And I'm Drew. Okay, so you may have noticed, but there's a new fella on the podcast. Yeah, that is the new Tyler. I mean, <laughs> Tyler, you moved to Oklahoma. Yeah, okay. and got fatter <laughs> in the process. <laughs> Old, I was going to go for older. Yeah. More, more mature. Okay, let's just, let's, let's. Okay. Okay. Anyways, Tyler will join us again, I'm sure, someday. Uh, his life has just become very hectic, so what can you say? Anyways, welcome, Nate, to the Linux cast. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Nate has been editing the podcast for, oh goodness, I don't know, six months or so? Probably about? Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while? Uh, yeah. Anyway, so if you've if you've listened to or watched the edited, edited versions of the podcast that come out on Saturdays and they sound excellent, that's the man right there, the reason why it happens. Um, so there you go. Uh, you'll notice that this upcoming Saturday won't sound as good because I have to edit it. <laughs> so <laughs> there you the go. The bad thing about it is Nate kind of counts the number of ums that he has to like clip out and like gives us like a like a grade. Like your grade <laughs> was shite this week. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> there there are um leaderboards somewhere in his on one yeah. of his monitors. <laughs> It's back there on that one. I just have it grayed out so you can't see it. So, <laughs> so yeah. it's like a he has like a he has a a macro key. So every time he hits the macro key, it ups the counter once. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Anyways, welcome to Linux Cast. We talk about Linuxy things, and we have a good one for you tonight. We're going to talk about our favorite terminal commands, terminal applications, and all that kind of stuff. We'll talk a little bit about why we use the terminal, all that stuff. So it's going to be fun. But first, as we normally do, so first off, we've been off for a couple of weeks. Drew has been through a, like a hurricane it was horrendous down there and uh thank goodness drew is okay um and has power back just today the power came just back today right drew <laughs> yes it yeah yeah it, we got power my, my my mother still doesn't have power but and a lot of other people i think it's about a hundred thousand in the uh in the county that i live a hundred thousand people still don't have power yet but uh it's going in the right direction at least work that they've done to get power back has been incredible because we lost it last year we had six hundred thousand here in michigan after a big storm yeah. and it took them like 10 days they were really slow <laughs> yeah so it probably seemed really long for you guys but i'm very impressed so anyways no yeah we're lucky seriously. yeah all right anyway so we're gonna talk about what we've done this week in foss or technology or literally anything so why don't you drew you take us away if you got anything to talk well about. i i mean uh, <laughs> without power it's a little uh, challenging to get a lot of stuff done uh in the foss world but i will say that my like i said my computer usage has been sparse so i'm not going to necessarily apologize for not following up on the next cloud installation video that i did yet uh but i will say that i have not forgotten and that content should be forthcoming in the next few days or so. So I, uh, I, like I said, I don't have a lot to report, but I'm not forgetting. I remember you guys and the pushback that we got about NextCloud and it's coming. There's more content on NextCloud. And I'm so looking forward to it. <laughs> that first video was money. It was great. So oh. sorry, that's it. No, I I, I, I asked you to go first because I pretty much figured that. Jen, no, it was going to be short and concise, right, Matt? I was Drew just, just turned his computer on like half an hour ago. <laughs> still works. <laughs> <laughs> Debian's still just strong as ever. It made it through the hurricane. Line. <laughs> All right, Nate, what about you? You do anything interesting this week? So since I'm getting close to my schooling, I actually completely wiped Windows again and converted my main desktop back to Pop OS. Thank God. <laughs> and. I've been working on a bash script on putting some more of my scripts back into my system. And last thing is I actually started my YouTube channel of Nate Picks Tech World, had my first video out. So you'll have to make sure you send me that link again so that I can put it in the show notes. Uh, yep. Cause you, and you can pop it in the chat too, if you want, Nate, let people know who are here live that they can go subscribe to your, t your, t your YouTube channel, the next Mr. Beast right there, ladies and gentlemen, we all knew him before he was, he was famous. Uh, if you if you do start giving money out though, um, just remember where your friends are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know I got to pay you back for Resolve. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm. I, I do blame you for getting me on Resolve though. 
<laughs> Damn it. If only they had a flat pack, it'd be so much better. Anyways, that's beside the point. So for me, I've done several things. So uh, probably the most lame one was that I've been flopping around back and forth between Xorg and, and Wayland and window managers just for fun. I've been having a lot of fun going back and forth between different window managers. I still found that my two favorites are Qtile and i3. They're really i3 is so good. Like it is the best window manager. I'm sorry, Drew, but it is the best. Um, I like. Mm. Don't, don't get me wrong. I like DWM, but i3 is just so good. There's there's no limit to what you can do with it. I don't think. Like it's just so. I'll give you top three, but come on. Yeah. <laughs> What do you know? You're a Debian user. <laughs> I, I, I've been so anti everything distro related today, just because I've been trolling everyone in my Discord. <laughs> it's just it's been great, um, very sassy today. I don't know what's wrong with me. And anyways, the uh, it, it's just so good. So I've been doing some scripting related to that to try to get th things back up and running to, to the point where everything is, is where it goes. So that's been very good. I've also been messing around with transferring my Plex server from a Debian package to a Docker container. And there's no real uh, like performance thing that you, reason why you'd want to do this, but the reason why I decided to do it is because I have Watchtower installed and that will keep the Docker container up to date and Plex updates like every other week. And it was getting annoying. Every time they released a new dev package, I'd have to go to the website, download the dev package, install it with DPKG, and, and restart everything, the services and stuff like that. And it was just annoying. I didn't want to do that because I always had to download it on my computer, transfer it over SCP. It was it, I could have used wget, I suppose, but I didn't. Uh, so I transferred it over to the Docker container. And just having a so update has been great. But also I've noticed that it was just easier to set up. I didn't have to deal with any, like, I don't know if you guys have ever noticed, like on Plex or Jellyfin, where if you have your media on an external drive or something like that, you have to deal with stupid Linux permissions. With the Docker container, I didn't have any of those problems. My, 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 uh, all my media is actually stored on an NFS server with a different username and it had no problem seeing any of the media. That That was just shocking for me. Like, cause every time I set up Plex, I have to like, oh, I have, basically every time I set up Plex, I have to do seven, 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 the media <laughs> directories in order to get them to see, to see it. So this time I didn't have to do that. And that was great. So that, that was, those are the two things that I've been basically doing this week. Now, uh, have you documented these things is what I want to know. So. I have the Plex stuff, but I haven't put it up online yet. Uh, okay. I need to go through and proofread it and make sure that I hadn't spent stuff. Cause I did most of that stuff at like three o'clock in the morning. So it was not, uh, I, I I'm pretty sure that I misspelled some things, so, but yeah, I, I, I did uh, write that down in a, a markdown file, and that'll be up cool. later when I push that later. So yeah, so those are the things we've done this week in, in FOSS. We will do we do that every week, just kind of because we do it, you know, interesting things. Sometimes, sometimes we don't do interesting things at all, and we just want to talk about random stuff. So there you go. So we're gonna move on to the main topic, which is our favorite terminal apps and commands and all that stuff. So. As is usual when it comes to a Matt cast, I don't have any rules. So if you have something that's kind of tangentially related that you want to share when it comes to terminal stuff, I'm fine with it. Like if you want to talk about your favorite terminal or whatever, that's fine. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll do the same thing we did when we talked about things we can't live at all. We'll just go around in a circle and we'll do one each and we'll go until we run out or we, we run out of time. So uh, Drew, do you want to go first? Yes. So I think... There are some subjects that are in this terminal app space. Like we talked about, you know, we're gonna, we can talk about our favorite text editor, for example. And I will not take NeoVim from you, Matt. I will you. allow you, allow you. It's just podcast, guys. Uh, I, will, I will say that I will go with Micro for my text editor of choice for the command line. And because it's lightweight and because it's not nano, and and that's that's really the only criteria. I, now that doesn't mean that I don't have a NeoVim configuration because I do, and I really like it, and I wish I could use it more effectively and efficiently. I just don't. But the truth of the matter is, Micro has been something that I've been using for quite a while, and I like it, and I like it a lot. So there you go. Micro is my first application within the terminal that I enjoy, and it is a text editor. Micro is really good. Um, if Vim didn't exist, Micro would probably be where I was at. Uh, 
Nate, go ahead. Your next, your first one. So I had to scratch mine off the list because that was my. Oh, first one. sorry, Nate. <laughs> if I had no, it's seen. Fine. It's fine. I think for me, and I know you have one that's similar. I think for me, the one I use every day is Neo Fetch, and I know that it's technically depreciated, but I can't get away from it. It just works. It's fast for me, and it's easy to customize. And having all my system information up every day, it's just it's great. And it makes really nice, pretty screenshots. That's all it you does. need. To, it really does. That's all you need to worry about. Yeah, you you can't share your rices on Unix porn without a fetch hmm. program. You just can't do it. It's against the it literally. It's actually literally against the rules. <laughs> you have to. It's in the rules. So have you tried fast fetch then at all or? Yeah, I just I. I don't know. Something about it just doesn't really click with me. Okay. And so I, eventually I know I have to switch. I just, I'm kind of old and I get used to one way and I just want it to be that way for a while. The younger guys say they're old. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> the thing about fast fetch is the, the config file. Like I, I, I've switched, mm -hmm. but Jason is just not, you know, great. It's better than YAML. But it's not much better than YAML. So all you programming nerds, you can come at me now. This is great. Uh, all right. So my first one, I'll, I'll just go ahead and get mine off the get Neo Vim off the, the list because yeah, Neo Vim is number one on mine. Now I'll be honest with you guys, I could very easily go back to Vim and not care. I find Neo Vim a little bit faster than Vim, but the reason why you use Neo Vim is because you can do it in Lua, and I don't. Like my config is in Vim script, so it'd be very easy to transition back over to Vim. I will probably never transition over to Lua because I don't like. I'm a. I didn't realize this about myself, but I am a language no, uh, snob. Like if it's not C or Python, it's dead. <laughs> okay, I don't know why. It's stupid. I'm not a programmer, so I can have those silly opinions, and they don't really matter. But I don't really care for Lua. I've tr I've tried some Lua configs. Like I tried yours, Drew. I've tried like uh, NV Chat or whatever it is or uh, whatever they call it. And and I've caught I've tried Luna Vim, Lunar Vim. All those not not yours so much, but the other ones, ones that people have gone through and like put the made made them into an IDE or whatever. They're just totally overkill for what I need Vim or Neo Vim to do. So it's just easier for me to have my config, which is very simple. It just has basic things like the Markdown plugin, things like that, that, you know, I use for writing. But other than that, I could easily go back to Vim. But NeoVim is faster a little bit, so I use that. And I don't know that I need to say much more about Vim just being awesome. I, I make everything into Vim. I have a Vim plugin for Vivaldi. I have a Vim plugin for all sorts of things. All of my window my managers use Vim bindings for basically everything. So I'm sorry. The thing for Vivaldi is it just does it just take on Vim motions? Is that is that the the goal of that then? Or well, it does a whole bunch of stuff. So okay. if, like for example, you can hit F and it'll it will highlight all the links on the page, and then you can use another key binding to go to any link on the page. Okay. You can go down. You can use all of Vim motions if you want to. You can enter visual mode to select things. Uh, you can do searching with slash and you can use, con you know, uh, cool. N and control N to go back and forth between the searches and stuff. Basically, anything you can do in Vim, you can do inside a browser. Now, uh, that's not like Vivaldi specific. There's one for Firefox called Tridactyl, which is fantastic. It's so good. I miss it. Like, like I would, I, I every once in a while we'll think about switching back to Firefox just because that is so good. Um, okay. And if you're in Chrome, there's another one called surfing key, something like that. There's also one called Vimium C. I think I use Vimium C on, uh, on uh, Vivaldi. So yeah, I've put Vim everywhere that I can. It is the best Linux terminal application and I will fight anyone who says otherwise. <laughs> okay. Uh, Drew, your second one. So I am a Debian user, which allows me to install something that most of you are not using <laughs> because it's so old. So EXA is in the Debian repos. Uh, if you are using either the testing branch or even the newer versions of Ubuntu or what have you, EZA is going to be, is what you will use now. So between EXA and EZA, both written in Rust, by the way, you have a really modern alternative to the traditional ls command. And if you put it in your bash rc as a, an alias, uh, there is a very good 
way to look and view your, your file structure. So most of you probably know that already. I'm just using it <laughs> because it's really stinking awesome. It is one of the very first things that I install uh, when I am setting up a new machine. EXA is what I would put, but if I was, you know, in Debian 13, I think it will be gone and EZA will be the, uh, you know, the new LS uh, alternative rather. There you go. Nate, go ahead, your next one. So I'm actually going to switch to a couple commands that I use every day, Sorry. especially dealing with file servers. And the first one is CD. And I know you made a video about another application that kind of replaces CD, but I, like I said, it's a little old school, but I make directory. The reason I'm bringing these two up is because I, for the longest time, could not figure out how to ever put spaces in file names. And when you try to search for it online, there's nothing. And I think I searched for almost two months and I finally found one Reddit post that said, Hey, by the way, use parentheses. And so whenever you do like a make directory, if you want to actually put a space in the name, you put a parentheses, spell it out how you want, close the parentheses, and it will actually make the file exactly the way you want. And I have to use that every single day. So for me, those two things conjunction, it's become natural for me. Yeah, I use the parentheses things all the time too, but I also force myself to learn the the, the backslash thing trick mm. that you're supposed to use, because in some certain in some uh, shells the parentheses don't or the quotation marks don't work. All right, so I'll, I'll, my next one is actually Zoxide, uh, which is that thing that Nate was talking about. It is a replacement for CD, kind of. You can still you can still use CD for some things if if you want to, but I've been using I've just aliased CD to Zoxide now. It is phenomenal. It basically what it does is it builds a a database of everywhere you've gone in the terminal and then it will take you can just use say you you always visit a folder called writing okay which i do you can just do z and then the word writing or wri and it will take you to that uh, directory as long as you've been there before and the more you use it the more that database increases and that means that it it knows more and can help you move between your file system. There's no more CD dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot anymore for me. I haven't done that in, in a week. It's awesome. I just, if I'm in, if I'm 10 directories down in my, in my config folder or whatever, and I want to go to my documents folder, I just do CD DOCU. It'll take me to my documents folder, no matter where I'm at on this system. It's amazing. I don't know if I could ever live without it again, because it's just, I, I it's just so good. And the awesome news is it's on every distro. It's on Debian. It's on Ubuntu. It's on OpenSUSE, Arch. Uh, so it's just it's just fantastic. Uh, and if you want to know more, I did make a video about it. It's really, really good. So that's Dockside. Drew, your next one. So I am, I don't know, I've, I've often said that I have like a, a ton of switches in my house and I've got a lot of stuff that's like networked in the house. I don't know how many you guys, you guys have like, but between both Wi-Fi uh, connections and wired connections, if you want to find a list of everything that's connected rather than actually going to your router to look at that, I use Nmap, okay? Nmap. Uh, if you are looking for the actual command, it would be nmap and then space dash sn and then the IP address, your lo your internal IP, so 192.168.1.0 and then slash 24. And it will, it will actually scan your entire network and look for all of the connections within the network. And hopefully you have like host names that you can kind of like distinguish between <laughs> which machine. I was like, oh, my printer is on dot 27. And, uh, and that way you, you know where it is. I always like forget stuff. I'm like, oh, man, where I don't even have any idea where that's what's what IP address that server's on. So I ended up sometimes going to Nmap so that I can list out. I know what the name of the server is. I just don't know what IP it's on. And that helps me retrieve that information. If you use like a whole bunch of virtual machines, that'll also help because you okay. can show you all the 
virtual machine IP addresses. So like with Proxmox, each of the virtual machines get their own uh, IP address. And I can't remember them to, for the life of me. So I always have to look those up because they're like really close, like within a number of each other. Like, is, is that 142 or is that one 142? I don't remember. So, okay, yeah, that, it's a great little tool. Nate, your next one. So I'm actually going to piggyback off of Brews and I use speedtest.net or mm -hmm. speedtest slash net. And if you're like me that finally got internet, thank you, Elon. <laughs> that's decent compared to at t 4G LTE nonsense. A lot of times I have to make sure that my connection is stable. And so being able just to pull up a quick command command line and just run speed test slash net instantly gives me a readout and I know exactly kind of what I can do and what I can't. And so that is something I do use. I wouldn't say every day, but pretty much any system that I either reinstall or pull back up and make sure the Wi-Fi is working, all that what I use all the time. Cool. Did you read, Nate, that there that Starlink petitioned the FC, FTC for the ability to do one gig per second speeds? Yes. That, that, yes. Like, also, they are fixing to, they already got a contract with T-Mobile and they're fixing to start releasing satellites that have cellular service. I think they already have like seven in the sky or something like that. Elon's going to rule the world, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, also Yeesh. just, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's going to be fine. I'm sure he's, I mean, he's perfectly Ugh. rational. Uh, <laughs> Nate, did you, have you heard of one? I think it's called like, uh, speed test DB or something like that. It's a Docker container. It runs in the background and just keeps a constant, like, uh, it, every three hours will test your internet speed and keeps a database for you. Yes, but I, I've never really found a reason to use it. I think, I do believe, uh, War Thunder actually uses it. Uh, for him, but I've never really found a use for that. I just mostly only need it if I'm actually pulling something up and I need to make sure that I'm connected. And that's about it. Makes sense. All right. Um, my next one is actually similar to one that Drew just or did a couple of times turn or turn ago. Uh, he did EXA. I I'm, I use LSD still. I know people have seemed to have moved away for that for some reason, but it works fine for me. I don't do any configuration on it at all. I just use it stock out of the box. It just makes Alice look pretty. I'm sure there are other things that you can do with it. I don't. Um, I've never even actually really looked into the config file for it. It just runs stock on my system. It's very, very good. And it just looks pretty. And I used EXA for the longest time. And then when it, somebody pointed me towards LSD and then I moved there and I see no reason to leave, leave it behind. So uh, LSD is great. It just makes LS prettier. That's really all it is. Uh, Drew, your next one. So I talked about IP addresses and that I can never remember them. So I actually have in my Bash RC an alias that just says my IP. And, and what it does is two things. One, it actually will, it's like IP dash F INET address. And I'll, I'll, if in the show notes, if you want to like a link to my bash RC file so that you can actually look at the very, very long string of characters that make up this particular alias, uh, I will do that. Uh, but basically it's got a couple different grep, uh, commands within the INET, uh, and it shows my, my, what my internal IP address, but the second part of that, of that alias is curl and then ifconfig.me. So it actually will show you what your internal IP address and your external IP address. So you don't have to go to like, what is my IP.com and show what your external IP is. I do it uh, in command line so that I can see what my internal and my external IP address in four characters, my IP, that's it. So there you go. So I'm actually going to uh, talk about one that I, I think you know the pain of having dyslexia. And as many times as I have typed LS wrong, <laughs> uh, there's actually a program that is pretty funny, and it just pulls up. If you type SL, it'll pull up a train and just go across your terminal. And I know somebody <laughs> did that as a joke, but it's hilarious. And every time I do it now, it reminds me, oh, yeah, you misspelled it. So... I like to also type it in with LOL cat because it makes it look funky and pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just 
it's just it's a fun little thing that you know if i do misspell it and it starts doing the train i'm like oh yeah i forget i need to respell <laughs> okay so you're right I, I have dyslexia too and i have just gone through and just aliased everything backwards so i i have a, an entire section in my alias file of things that i needed that i type every time just spelled the other direction around or with the, a letter in the middle <laughs> Like, uh, I have one that's, you know, DC, I have SL, I have, uh, I, I for, for the longest, I, it, it's been better now, but for the longest time, I always did MDKI, MDKIR, some of the, <laughs> like, I could not for the life of me spell it right. It, it's stupid. So, yeah, I, I feel that. I don't know that I would have the patience for the train, but it sounds cool. Um, like it, when I, when I misspell something and, and it does, I don't have an alias. I get angry at it because like I need to do this thing. I don't have time for you to go floating off, floating off the page. All right. So mine first, actually, Ricardo. Thank you for the super chat. He says for those who want a package manager that works on any Linux distro and Mac, there is a GetFox SH. It has many hand cured programs on it. It's great. Well, thank you for that. Thanks for the super chat again. Uh, so my next one is... All right. So actually, I'll just go with... I'll skip around a little bit on my list a little bit. So I'll just go... Seeing as how we mentioned aliases. I have probably close to 150 aliases. And I add probably two or three a week. Like, you know, if, if, if I can... If I do it often enough that I've done it more than twice, I will just go add it as an alias. So... Um, every server that I have or every Proxmox server that I, or the VM that I have, I have the SSH thing for that into an alias. So I just, if I want to go to my Docker, my Docker VM, I just should type in Docker VM and it SSH is into it. Oh. Uh, same thing with, uh, you know, my Plex server and all that stuff. That way I just don't, I don't have to remember the name of it. If, if I, for whatever reason forgot, I don't have to remember the. Uh, the IP address, if I'm on local networks or if I'm connected via VPN, I don't have to worry about actually remembering to do that. It just does it. Uh, so uh, I, I'd, I'll i talk more about WireGuard later, but I also have one for WireGuard. So every time I need to connect to WireGuard, I just do WGU and it connects to Molvad. WGD goes down. So I, I have a ton of aliases. I think aliases are one of the coolest things you can do on a terminal. If you use the terminal a lot, and you don't utilize aliases, there's something wrong with you because it is so good. It saves you so much much, much time, and especially if you you're one of the, if you're like me, I'm, and both my friends here can attest to this. I'm horrible with names. I don't remember things easily. No. It's a it's a horrible trait for a historian. I have to take notes on everything. It's the reason why I'm so big on notes. I write everything down. If I don't remember a command, I'm not going to remember it. But I have a more of a tendency to remember names that I create. So by creating an alias, I'll remember it better, therefore not having to remember the name. So for example, I don't, I hardly, I cannot remember the the command for creating a snapshot for with Snapper. Can't remember it. There's always a flag there that I, don't, I think it's just dash dash create. But I always try to make it more complicated than it needs to be. So I've just created an alias that says Snapper create, and it does it. It's awesome. Um, so use aliases. You won't regret it. It's very very good. So yeah, that's that's my. Uh, PSA for the day. Uh, Drew, your next one. So, Matt, I was going to ask you, I am about to say Midnight Commander. I couldn't remember if you've done a video on this or not. I did one on something called Gnome Commander. Okay. And that is a GUI front end or GUI representation of Midnight Commander. So, Midnight Commander, I discovered fairly recently and i know that uh, jay from uh, learn linux tv did kind of like a uh, a tutorial on it fairly recently actually but i it was just perfect timing because i thought uh let me go look at this uh midnight commander and then all of a sudden he had a video on it i really like it i mean in terms of a visual file manager that's in the terminal uh, it, it really reminds me of kind of like your favorite <laughs> GUI file manager, Matt. And uh, it, it just happens to be in the terminal. So Midnight Commander, or MC, is the, uh, is the file manager that I really have been liking. And I used to use Ranger and 
a couple other things. And I know, Matt, you're, I don't know if Yazi is on your list or not, but it is. Okay. So Midnight Commander, I've, I've, I really like, by the way, I don't know if any of you guys have used it for anything uh, long-term at, or in the chat, if you've used it for anything long-term, but I, I think I will actually, I think this is something I'm going to use more and more frequently, especially when I'm doing something on a server, you know, moving files on the server. I mean, I can always do everything kind of like CP dot dash capital R blah, blah, blah. But this seems to be really kind of like streamlined and very, very, I don't know. It's, it's a, it's a nice visual way to navigate and to move and rename files and delete and so on. Anyway, Midnight Commander. Excellent. I have a question for you, Drew. With Midnight Commander, can you have, first off, how does it deal with SSH or do you just have the, them in, as mounted? Like I have, directly? I'm, I think I'm a noob. Uh, so I don't know that I have the answer for that. Um, so with SSH, I have not used, I've only used it locally so far, Matt. So I have not used it, but I, that's a good, that's actually a good use case that I have not tried yet. For the longest time, so you, you know, I'm a I'm big, thinking I might do that right now. Hold on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll just, we'll just wait here for you, Drew. Okay. okay. Uh, I, we'll, we'll just sh share your screen. We'll just do it together. <laughs> we even try, that'd be great. Yeah. I don't think so. But okay. Uh, um, <laughs> Because for the so you know I'm a big fan of Crusader and the reason why is because of the dual pane. But when it comes to terminal file managers, I've never been a I've never really seen a reason for having a dual pane terminal file manager. It really doesn't make I've never like like I think LF and VIFM or whatever both of those have dual panes. I've never really thought of a reason to have them. But I was just thinking about that when you mentioned you know a server. It'd be really cool if you, especially if it doesn't require you to have them mounted. Like if you don't have to have like NFS or SSHFS or something like that. If you could just SSH into a server on one side, SSH into a server on the other side, and then copy files back and forth, that'd be freaking cool. I don't know that that's possible or not, but that 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 right there would be a great use case for a dual pane file manager in a, in the terminal. Now you could do that in Crusader, easy peasy. Like that that wouldn't be hard at all. And, uh, Nate, your next one. So I'm actually going to talk about um, a terminal that I use for me with Tilex, but uh, there's another shell that I like to use sometimes, uh, especially using Rust, and that's, I uh, can't pronounce it, it's New Shell, it's N-U-S-H-E-L-L, -L, and it basically is a, it's a new shell type that is written in Rust, and I know that some people like freak out about Rust, but I like it because it's memory safe for me. But yeah, it, it's just kind of a prettier version that you can use, and it works really well with cargo when you're trying to go through files and stuff like that. So just something to look at and use a little bit different. I guess I'll go with WL Copy and XClip. These are just kind of two sides of the same program. Uh, they are terminal commands for adding something to a clipboard. So if you want to say, for example, let me just use an example that I use it for. So I have two documents on my system. One's called video description, one's called pod description. And they're basically just templates for the descriptions that I use for either the videos that I create or the podcasts. They have some, some things that I still have to you know, type in or whatever, like the actual thing the video is about. But it has like the contact information and the stuff that just doesn't change. And the easiest way for me to get to that is to put it, you know, just copy and paste it. And the easiest way to do that is with something called WL copy if you're on Wayland or XClip if you're on uh, XClip. I just basically cat those, that, that document into either WL copy or XClip and it'll add it to the clipboard and then I can just paste it wherever I need to paste it. And you can do this with any command you want. So if you want to echo or cat, or if you're, if you're running, you, uh, if, if say, for example, you wanted to share your Hyperland configuration or whatever, you can just cat your Hyperland config into WL Copy, and then you can paste that into Discord or wherever you need to share it. Uh, it's, it's easier than having to go find the file and upload the file, which oftentimes, you know, maybe there's file limits or whatever in Discord that you don't want to run into. So I, I do that probably... 10 times a day because uh, a lot of my editing I do inside of Vim and then I copy it out of Vim and put it back in Google Docs, which, <laughs> by the way, not <laughs> supposed to do that, but I, I do it anyways. Uh, so I, I, I do my editing in Vim, take it back out, and the easiest way for me to do 
that is just to cat it into either WL copy or xclip depending on what window manager i'm in and it's awesome so drew your next one so i'm gonna i work as a someone that uses a lot of domain names um, and so who is is something that i use a lot if not every day unfortunately uh, I used it a lot more back uh, several years ago when privacy was not as big an issue as it is now. But, you know, I used to just say, who is uh, the linuxcast.org? And it would show me all of the pertinent information from the registrar. And that was something that I, that I used to contact, you know, the registrant for a specific domain name and then talk to them about either, you know, some type of business uh, relationship that we could have, or even just purchase their name. I'm surprised I didn't get the linuxcast.org. I'm just, I'm just saying back in the day, you know, but uh, <laughs> it would, it would have taken a lot of money, I'm sure. But oh yeah, I th- Lo- loads of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, who is, uh, was something that I have used uh, like forever. And it's something that I still do. Uh, it just isn't as useful as it used to be. All right. Uh, Nate, your next one. So I have three of them in a row. Uh, I'm a type of guy that I like to use my tops. And I have three GPU tops that I kind of bounce in between depending on my GPU. I have NV top that does work with NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel. I will say that the Intel kind, the memory, is, it may work, it may not, because they haven't quite gotten that figured out yet. Uh, but for AMD, you also have AMD. Uh, yes, I'm reading off my notes here. but AMD GPU top and also Radeon top. And those two are usually pretty good and give you pretty accurate information when you're using it. Um, and if you're like me and like to play games, having something like that is worth it. Nice. I Honestly, I don't think that my fan for my GPU is probably ever spun up. <laughs> That's how little I use it. I'm not a, I'm not a gamer. Uh, although I'm probably, I was going to say that probably the one on the other computer that I do the DaVinci Resolve stuff on, probably then it, it works hard. Yeah, but- it's really good too. Like if you're wanting to monitoring how much RAM that you have, because I know Re- Resolve can get kind of heavy. And so if you want to just see how much memory that you're using, uh, VRAM and stuff, yeah, it's it's a great thing to pull up and just kind of keep an eye on. Next one is Borgmatic. So I don't... I've talked about this, I think, on the podcast before, where my backup strategy for a long time wasn't fantastic. I was always just backing up to one place, and I've been working over the course of the last couple of weeks to back up to more places. And I've used Borg for quite a while, but it's always been manual Borg, or I've been using Vorta. But the thing is, I need to find a way to back up the home lab, and you can't really use... I'm sure I probably could figure out how to do it, but... I. I figured it would be easier to just use a terminal command to back up from my home lab to Borgbase. And Borgmatic does this, and because it's all, it just basically schedules a cron job, it backs it up once an evening, and it's great. And if you've used Borg before, you'll know that you do have to have some knowledge of SSH in order for this to work. It's not always easy because Linux permissions are the stupidest thing in the history of the world. <laughs> and you have to you have to deal with those kind of, kinds of things. So, for example, if you store all of your Docker container volumes and such in your root directory, anywhere in your root directory, Borg doesn't like that because it runs as a it, you run it runs as a user service, not as a root service. You can run Borg as a as, as sudo, uh, but then you have to remember that you have to restore as sudo. Otherwise, you will not have permissions to view any of the stuff that you restore. So it's a bit of a pain if, like me, my volumes are all over the place. I don't have my volumes all in the same place. So I have the vast majority of them are in a root directory in slash SRV. But I also have ones that are connected via NFS. And those are on a completely different thing. And I want to back them all up at the same time in the same repository. It turned out it just wasn't possible. So I ended up having to create multiple repositories, and that means I have to have Borgmatic running on both Proxmox uh, VMs. It wasn't great, but Borgmatic made it fairly easy because I could just transfer over the uh, config file and the SSH keys and all that stuff. It wasn't too bad. So it saved a little bit of work from having to do it manually. 
And now that once it's set up, it's basically just, I have to make sure it keeps running. Uh, that's all I have to do. And it's just there. It's great. So Borgmatic's my next one. Uh, Drew, your next one. So I have a question for you though, uh, Matt. If is Todoist is that a command line or is that a GUI it, um, application? It's a GUI. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Because I was looking at my list and I have not used Task Warrior, but I wanted to know if you had used Task Warrior as a. I have. Uh, okay. Yeah. What did you What did you think of that? It's really good, but it's not Todoist. And that's been my problem. So we've talked about notes many times, you and I, Drew. Yeah. And my, for the, there for the longest time, I was the Google Keep guy. And the reason why I couldn't go somewhere else was because Google Keep basically had everything. I'm yeah. in the same position with Todoist. It has all of my stuff there. And transferring over to something that I don't know if I'm going to stick with it or not, I haven't had, been able to find that thing yet. So... Task Warrior was really good, but it didn't capture my interest enough to transfer everything over. Plus, the way they do recurring uh, tasks was really weird. I don't remember. There was just I don't remember what caught my eye about it, how they did it, but it was really weird. So, yeah, I didn't want to recommend it if I hadn't used it, but it was on my list, and I just was like, it just popped in my head real quick. Anyway, the what I was going to mention was I used Dig. It's DIG stands for Domain Information Groper, <laughs> just in case you were interested. So it's a command line tool for querying DNS. So like, let's say, for example, you move your website to a different server and you go, I don't know if it's resolving or not. I use DIG to see where, you know, where the IP of that particular domain name is, uh, where, what the A record is. And even a more specific thing, if I have moved mail, I want to know I use a dig and then an MX record command to know where that mail is now resolving, whether it be, you know, if I've moved from, let's say, to Proton Mail or what have you, I want to know where, where that mail is going. So dig is a command that I uh, use all the time. Uh, I hate DNS. Uh <laughs> uh, I want to combine two. So I have two that I use every day. Uh, number one is timer dash C L I. And basically it's just a terminal timer and it does have a bell that does ring once it hits, however long that you've put the duration is. And then also I use TTY clock. It's just a digital clock. You can kind of, I, I talked about it in my video, you know, the options and the buttons that you can use to kind of center it and make pretty colors, all that kind of stuff. But for just a quick glance and I always have my terminal open, TTY clock is where it's at. I actually use TTY clock as well, but I, for the timer, I use one called term down and that's a little bit more yep. uh, manual. Cause it's like, it doesn't have a bell. I had to script the bell myself, but I, I use that for writing sprints when I'm doing like NaNoWriMo or something like that. That's usually, yeah. that well, and this one's written in uh, Python. So it's, you know, it's like pip install some, what, whatever it's, it is, but I like it just a simple fact, you know, if I'm, if I'm trying to do like a speed run or something of maybe if, Every once in a while, I try to see how fast I am writing a program. I think the most I've gotten is two and a half hours. So <laughs> I suck at speed runs. I, I, I'm really bad at them. Like, like I get distracted. I, I think at one point I did a speed run, and like halfway through, I went to watch a cat video. So my ADHD <laughs> was was in full effect. I'm not good at them. That's the reason why I stopped doing those videos. Like too many people just make fun. Like I did one that was like an hour and a half, like like a racing video it was a speed run. The person was like, got in and was like, this is a speed run. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was great. So my next one is Pulse Mixer. So uh, if you've used Linux for any amount of time, like for longer than a couple of years, you'll have probably been here when audio was god awful on Linux, and when Pipewire was just beginning to be a th you know a thing, and it was constantly breaking with every update. And during that time, I had. I, along with like literally everybody else, had to always constantly monitor the sources of your audio, especially if you did audio production content. There's nothing more embarrassing than doing an entire video where you realize you didn't use your $400 microphone that sits in your, in your face. You instead used the $20 webcam microphone that sits on top of your monitor six feet away, you know, and you didn't realize it until you were editing. <laughs> so I can't tell you the number of times I did that. So I found, and I don't always 
have a GUI available. So I don't like, uh, especially if you're a window manager, you probably don't have a, a like a Pavu control already installed. So I install Pulse Mixer like instantaneously on every time I install an operating system. It it works for both Pulse Audio and uh, Pipewire. Uh, as long as you have Pipewire Pulse, by the way, you, you have to, I do believe that's a hard dependency. Uh, but basically, it's just a terminal TUI that allows you to control your audio. You can control volume, you can switch between sources, to switch when you can disable sources, you can choose how they're output between analog and, and digital, however, you, you know, you can choose the different syncs and stuff like that. It's, it's great. It's very simple. You do have to have function keys, by the way. If you, if you have a keyboard, this only happens to someone who has a keyboard, you know, uh, hobby. But every once in a while, you'll get a keyboard that doesn't have function keys, and switching between the input and the output requires function keys. Now, I believe actually now you can use the mouse to do it, but that wasn't always true. <laughs> so it, I, at one point, I had a forty percent keyboard had no function keys, didn't have a layer for function keys. I had to go find another keyboard, plug it in, so I can just switch between the inputs, the input and the output. So that's a uh, obviously more of a me problem because I use weird <laughs> keyboards. But just, just I just wanted to put that out there. But anyways, Pulse Mixer, if you want to manage your audio sources and stuff from the terminal, Pulse Mixer is like the only option. Because I knew that you had you used Pulse Mixer, I have always added it as a scratch pad to every single window manager that I do in the event that Matt uses the window manager config that I that I have created. Just it's like, oh, it's super V, Matt, just in case you were interested. It's super V just so it, it, it is su it. it is super V. That's actually the one that I use. And it is, it is a scratch pad. Like I could actually bring it up right now. <laughs> yeah, there it is there it goes <laughs> so yeah uh it, it's just it's just the best and there are certain programs like that you just install automatically right and that's one of them for me so uh yeah drew your next one so i'm gonna i'm gonna shamelessly plug my uh my my github and the scripts that i write this is probably gonna be my last one because i do need to save a terminal for the uh I don't even know if we're calling it Nuggies of the Week anymore, Matt, but that's what we're going to. But regardless, I am going to say that I spent a month writing bash scripts. And this bash script was an installation. If you're using a Debian or a Debian based system like Ubuntu or Pop or whatever, it is an installation of a bunch of window managers. I am a window manager nut. It's the it's a fact, you know, but I have like I said I spent a month in creating these scripts that will install both the either a vanilla or a custom window manager and it, it includes awesome BSPWM, DK, uh, DWM, Fluxbox i3, IceWM, Openbox and Qtile. All of them you know, have, and it is your choice to install, whether it be just the vanilla one so that you can just create your own custom configuration yourself. Or if you want to try, you know, you start with my particular build for each one of these, and then you customize it yourself. But uh, yeah, that is a script that has been written for you and it works in command line. So there you go. Awesome. Uh, I forked that script, by the way. <laughs> yes, maybe i'll maybe i'll get to debbie in one of these days who knows uh nate your next one so i don't know if drew if mentioned this did you mention uh ffmpeg i have not i have not okay i hope that wasn't your nuggie of the week or whatever but, no but uh, i now now that you mentioned mate nate i have an extra one in my head for for later if i need one okay good yeah so for me you know editing videos and such um sometimes handbrake fails and so if I'm trying to convert a video to work well with like DaVinci Resolve, um, I'll quickly pull up a FFmpeg and convert it exactly what I need. And it's a powerful tool if you really sit down and learn it. And I will actually say out of all of the terminal line command things that we've talked about, this one actually has decent documentation so you can get some work done. And uh yeah it's it's a great tool to use and if you're like me that just absolutely has to have something for video converting it's free it's open source use it 
No, I was going to say, I, the, the, the thing that I was going to mention, I, I'll, I'll say, but I think everyone's going to know this about MKV Merge, <laughs> maybe. Uh, the truth of the matter is I've used M FFmpeg for actually cutting uh, videos that I have done. I was like, okay, I want to go from second one to one minute and 25 seconds. And I use FFmpeg to actually trim that video mm -hmm. so that I can then string them together using MKV merge later. But now I, I've kind of like streamlined that process, but, and that's how I do my YouTube videos. I use MKV merge. I just like, like I've said a million times, I just create MKV snippets and then merge them all together with this uh, command line utility. By the way, you don't install, if you're using Debian, you don't in, actually install it uh, mm -hmm. natively. You actually have to install a bigger package, which is called MKV Toolnix hyphen GUI. Uh, just in case you are interested. Um, the FFmpeg is one of those things that just does a ton of stuff. So it does video editing, apparently. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, you guys remember Terminal for Life? He made all of his YouTube thumbnails with FF, uh, FFmpeg. He just yeah. basically mm -hmm. did that. It was just like, what? <laughs> like, how can you do that? That's nuts. Yeah, uh, yeah was, well, that's a level that I'm not there yet. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm still working on videos. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm not either. I don't the FFmpeg has the same number of flags as like R sync. Like <laughs> if you don't know the flags, you're you're probably mm -hmm. out, out of luck. All right, so my next one is Newsboat. So I blame Drew for this cuz he got me back into RSS big time and I've been just an absolute nut job when it comes to adding RSS feeds to a fresh RSS. Like I'm now at like I don't know. 600 rss feeds it's nuts I, every every single youtuber that i follow i have that in in a, a, a rss feed every single uh, subreddit that i follow i have that in an rss feed I've, I've been looking for a way to get the comments for reddit into an rss feed there is a way to do it but i don't want them separate so it's okay basically if it can be put in an rss feed i've been doing it and i mostly view my rss feeds on my phone and we may talk about that some other time, but I do every once in a while want to check them on my computer. So I use Newsboat and Newsboat does work with fresh RSS. Uh, you have to put it in your configuration file and it just basically takes your username and, and password or whatever for your API and takes the, the, the API URL in there and it works really well. Now, there is a, uh, I haven't gotten around to it yet, but there is a way for you to tell Newsboat to recognize your categories so that they're all kind of like in order and organized and stuff. Otherwise, it just kind of plods all of your categories into one big giant feed, which is not great. It just lists sources and they're, not, they're all mixed up. But so that's the way I have it right now. But you can get them into categories, but it is a really good uh, RSS reader. Even if you don't use fresh RSS, and you just want to maintain a URLs file with all the RSS file uh, URLs in there. It's very, very good. Uses Vim commands, so you can use your Vim commands to move up and down. Uh, you can have it set up so that if you subscribe to, or if you follow an RSS feed from a YouTube channel, you can set it up so that you can just press a key binding that will open MK, uh, M, uh, MPD, MPV and just stream that YouTube video to your computer. You never have to visit YouTube again. It's really, really good. Um, so... Uh, Newsboat, if you use RSS, and by the way, you should use RSS. I think everybody should. Absolutely, yeah, it's great. absolutely. Yep, yeah. yeah. Drew, your next one. All right, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm kind of running, and, and there is the low hanging fruit, which is HTOP, which I will now take because what I have, what do I have left? What do I have left, friends? Uh, HTOP, BTOP. <laughs> but I will say there is one called Glances. I don't know if any of you guys have used Glances mm -hmm. before. Uh, so if you are looking for either, you know, some type of system monitoring, I always install BTOP for, for that matter, especially on a server, because it actually has a little bit more functionality in terms of, uh, seeing what the Ram is doing and so on. But, uh, I don't know if I took yours, Nate, but I, pre I apologize if I have, but, uh, I use BTOP for uh, system monitoring. All right. I'll actually add, there's also a BTOP plus plus. Okay. All right. I think the person who did that went through and re wrote rewrote that in 
every language there was possible. Like there's mm-hmm. there's one for Python, there's one for C, there's one for C plus plus, there's one for Rust. Uh, it's nuts. Uh, Nate, do you have any more? I have one more. Okay, do your last one, then I'll do one more. And this kind of Matt's going to be angry. Uh, this is more of a Ubuntu slash Debian thing. Uh, it's Nala, front end to app. Yeah. Uh, that's something I cannot live without. It it just looks prettier. It's faster. I can set my mirrors really easy uh, and pull quickly for any of my updates. Nala is just where it's at. I know there's app fast, but it, it still no. just looks ugly to me. And I'd much rather have the pretty, you know, display. <laughs> no, Nala's Nala's badass. I, and I know that if Matt was to use Debian or or, or a Debian based, you, he would be using Nala 100%. Mm. I use Nala on all of my VMs. Guys, all of my VMs are either Ubuntu or Debian based. So I... I I'm a, I'm not really a Debian hater. I just like giving you guys shit because it's fun. Okay. <laughs> no. Okay. Ex- okay. Come clean. If you weren't using OpenSUSE, what would you be using? Debian. There you go. I guess it's not. It's not even really a question. Well, okay. There is a question now because I've been using Bluefin for a while, and Bluefin's really good. Like it's really really good. I really like the ability. Like you guys, I talked about it earlier. I like to switch back and forth between tw- things. And like, I'm not a big distro hopper anymore, but I like to switch between GNOME and KDE and all of window managers, just being able to put in one command in the terminal and, and be able to switch between GNOME and KDE in the matter of like 30 seconds is awesome. It's just so good. Now I can do it on OpenSUSE thanks to snapshots, but it's not quite as easy. So Bluefin has some appeal for me, but yeah, it'd probably be Debian because it's just, you, you can't beat, like literally it could survive a nuclear explosion and still be probably still be able to pull updates you can't kill it <laughs> it you can only it hope to contain it <laughs> that's true all right uh my last one uh i do have a couple more but i will just say let's go ahead with yazi so yazi is a terminal file manager i have been a long time fan of ranger it is written in python it is slow because it's written in python you do notice it uh, although if you just if you're just a Ranger user, you probably don't notice it because you're not you don't have really anything else to compare it to. But once you've used Yazi, you'll notice how slow Ranger actually was. And it Yazi is really really good. It does configuration weird. Also, it doesn't use standard Vim key bindings across the board, which was really fucking annoying for me out of the box. Like uh, trying to delete something. Didn't re- they actually use the word delete instead of using like the you know uh, cut and paste and stuff like you would you normally do or uh, it, it's it just was not where I wanted to be at the box but using a key bind you know, their list of key bindings was really easy to switch, to switch it to where I needed to be and the best part is at least in most terminals it does image previews out of the box <laughs> like it doesn't require extraneous uh, like Uber Zug dependencies it doesn't require you to use w3m it doesn't it works well in the vast majority of terminals that i've used at least like it, it works in console it works in gnome terminal it works in kitty i'm not sure if it works in alacrity alacrity because alacrity does some really weird things regarding mm. uh, uh the dependencies and stuff so it may not work in alacrity but it works really really well and it's fast so yeah yazi is my uh is my file manager that I'd be using in the terminal. Just so you know, Matt, I did install <laughs> I did install uh Midnight Commander on our uh Jitsi server and it is working. <laughs> awesome. Okay, that's cool. I, I have Ranger on all of my servers, but that's just because they're in the repositories. Yazi's not yet in the Debian repositories yet. So um once that is uh you know I'll probably go there. Okay. So uh, that's it. I'm sure I probably could have come up with 15 or 20 more. Just to let you all know, <laughs> like I have so many, I, I didn't really, I thought I was going to have a hard time like coming up with things on the list, but I didn't like, that's the reason why I opened it up to scripts because I figured like if I can't come up with 10, I can at least, you know, add on my Gitter script or whatever, but it didn't even have to. All right. Anyway, so let's go ahead and move on to the last uh, part of the thing. And we just went through a whole episode of talking about things we use, but we're going to talk about some more things we use in the nuggies of the week. And yes, Drew, I think we'll go ahead and keep the name. Uh, even if Tyler does abandon us for uh, other things, uh, we'll go ahead and keep his crappy name for the end of the show. So 
There you go. I thought you have t-shirts. Don't you have t-shirts for these? For I nuggies? do. I have a, I have a Nuggies t-shirt. You can get it on Shameless shop. plugs. Stores. Yeah, uh, shop uh, at the LensCast.org. There you go. But uh, there is a there is a problem. You don't have my size. Oh. Yeah, they don't have my size either, so I gotta worry about it. <laughs> uh, Maybe I buy two and just put them together. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, they, uh, they they're not uh, big guy compatible. Apparently, that's okay. Uh, anyways, the uh, nuggies of the week where we talk about things that we like to share. It can be a tip, a trick, an app pick, or whatever. Uh, and we call them nuggies because my friends like to troll me. So, Drew, your nuggie of the week. So I am using a command line tool that I have been squirreling away for uh, for the entire episode. It's called. I'm, I, maybe I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's a tuin, a t u i n. It is a command line tool for Linux that acts as a history manager. So let's just say, are you guys familiar with this, by the way? Mm -mm. Okay. So let's just say you install a tuin. It keeps the history of your, you know, if if you're using Bash, for example. So, you know, to go back one command. In your terminal, you just hit the up arrow key. When you hit up the one up up arrow key with a two in installed in your terminal, it actually will show you the entire list of your bash history so that you can see it. And it is it numbers everything for you. There is search functionality, there is uh privacy. And it apparently is cross-shell compatible. So if you're using uh, Bash or uh, uh, ZSH or show or, or what have you, a two in, I've I've started to like, and I didn't know that I would actually. To you know when you when I like I said when I just hit that up arrow key, I'm I was I'm just usually expecting the last command that was was made in my terminal, but no, it actually shows you the entire entire Bash history of what you have, and then you can find it really quickly. It's like, oh, wow, okay, 25, uh, 25 commands ago, I did that. And you can just go 25, enter, boom, and it just uh, runs that command for you. So a two in, A-T-U-I-N. So it doesn't use something like FZF so you can like scroll up and down the, the list? I don't, actually, Matt, I've only been using it like, a short while. So I don't know that I have like a long enough list uh, yet. Okay. Um, so the reason why I ask is because Bluefin does something similar out of the box where if you press up, it brings up an FCF window and okay. you can just scroll up and down and then you hit enter and it'll run that command again. Oh, that's so nice something too. I don't, it, it may very well use that what you're talking about. It could, it's possible that it's just like a feet, like a something you have to turn on or something. I don't know. Okay. Um, but yeah, that, that's a cool feature. With with Zoxide, I don't think I'm ever going to use history ever again because I don't <laughs> I don't need to. Um, yeah. But uh, it'd be it'd be something to have on like a server or something that, that doesn't have Zoxide on it. Uh, Nate, do you have a nuggy of the week for us? I actually do. So I am going to be the shield guy and say, <laughs> if you're looking for a good video editor, technically. Or Linux, most of the time you're going to be using Kden Live, but I highly recommend try to get Resolve working because it's just faster, it's quicker, it it makes things look prettier, it makes the audio sound better. There's so many things you can do, and it also comes with a tool that a lot of people don't talk about, which is Blackmagic Raw Speed, and it is one of the best tools that actually tax your CPU and your GPU to see exactly how well that it will function. That's my nugget of the week. I have so many things to say about Resolve. I have a, I have a love hate relationship with it. It works really well. You can the, the fact that you can render an hour and a half long podcast in like seven minutes is just freaking bonkers. But man, do I wish it was easier to install. <laughs> like if they just, I want a flat pack so bad. Well, okay. So there's actually a guy that is working on trying to get all the dependencies to make Resolve into a flat pack, and he's doing it for both. Uh, studio and the free version so maybe that will become something but i think that black magic just needs to make a flat pack <laughs> for linux the fact that they chose rocky linux as the official linux distro for for their software is just it, it's bonkers to me like no yeah ubuntu no, really should have been the one to be uh, honest uh, 
Ubuntu, li- literally, like, I would have understood RHEL. Like, I would have understood mm-hmm. RHEL, but Rocky Linux? <laughs> I, I, I could probably count the number of people who I know use Rocky Linux as a desktop operating system on one hand. And I think I don't have, like, one finger up. Like, because, I mean, nobody, it's a server distro. Like, it's not, it's not, it's a stupid rant. I, I, I've gotten installed on Bluefin. I still have failed to get it to actually work on OpenSUSE. It just will not activate. The free version works fine. Uh, but the, the, the studio version, I just can't get it to activate. And the, the, the support people just tell me that I need to, to connect to the internet on a different network. That's their solution. Like, that's, that, that's not a, that's not actually a solution that works. Okay, <laughs> like it's like I'm not connected to a VPN. I actually tried connecting to a VPN. It still didn't work. It's it's stupid. Uh, anyways, there you go. Um, my Nuggie of the Week, I actually changed mine. I had the, the Plex Docker container as my Nuggie of the Week before, but I decided to change because I mentioned it earlier. So I don't have an open source one. Um, I've been trying to find a good RSS feed reader on the iPhone. I used Reader Classic for a while. But the developer has come out with a new version that doesn't support fresh RSS. And while he says he's going to maintain Reader Classic, I don't believe him. Uh, so I've looked, been looking for something different. I found a few. Uh, none of them are very good, unfortunately. They all have something weird that I don't like. But the one that I'm on right now is called Fiery Feeds. F-I-E-R-Y Feeds. It has a really good uh, UI. It's not quite as good as Reader Classic. Reader Classic had this really cool thing where you could go into one of the categories that you had listed and go into an article, read it, and then as you got to the end of the article, you could just flip up and it would take you to the next article. Makes sense, right? For whatever reason, Fiery Feeds decided it wanted you to swipe left and right. It just ruined my complete flow of everything. I'll get used to it, but it was really it was really hard for my muscle memory there for a while. But other than that, it's really it's really nicely designed. It does automatically uh, uh, update the feeds on your server using fresh rss so that's good and it also will pull down pictures and stuff like that so it'll make your feed look pretty if you have if the things have uh images and stuff so it's really good that's that's called fiery feeds surprisingly there's not as many rss feeds out there rss feed readers out there that you know are actually like true rss feed readers like half of them you'll find now are like ai rss feed reader like just shoot me now okay it's the stupidest thing all right anyways matt's in a ranting mood so I, you. i'm gonna i'm gonna shill it on the uh, next cloud news i'm just gonna put that out there because if you are if you're a next cloud user and you can use next cloud news i think there's a mobile client uh but far as fresh i mean it's not going to be as good as fresh rss probably because of the you know but my god uh people RSS feeds, awesome. Just mm-hmm. saying. Yep, so good. All right, so that's it for this one. If you want to watch us live, we record this live every Tuesday, or at least most Tuesdays. We we do take some Tuesdays off, but we've actually done pretty good this year for all the time we've had to, had to miss. We've managed to put some things together, so I'm pretty proud of us. So if you want to watch us live, we're at youtube.com slash linuxcast. Uh, we, rec- we stream live every Tuesday at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. We always have a good uh, time watching the chat go by we don't always respond to you guys because as is we already have adhd and get off on tangents and shit so it would just be worse if we were having chats with you guys but every once in a while we'll see something in the, in the chat that just you know grabs our attention so we always have a good time so join us live if you if you can if you can't the edited version of this usually edited by mr nate comes up on Saturday afternoons or Saturday evenings. You can find that on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash linuxcast, or on your favorite podcatcher. If you are a listener on Apple Podcasts or any podcast uh, listening service that allows you to leave a review, please do so. We would really appreciate it. Specifically, if you're on Apple Podcasts, that would really help us out if you went and left us a review. Uh, Preferably, not like the one guy who said, why did I listen to this podcast? Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure he was joking. He knew exactly why he listened to it because it's awesome. All right. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, you can find us on all sorts of places. The best place to find all of our contact information is on the website. That's linuxcast.org. Uh, Drew is a YouTuber as well. He is on uh, YouTube at youtube.com slash justaguylinux. There you'll find all sorts of awesome 
uh, content on Nextcloud, Debian, of course, because of, of course, uh, and a whole bunch of home lab and scripting stuff, window manager and stuff. So check out his channel as well. Nate, he just also opened himself up for YouTube. Uh, do you have a fancy link yet or you, or you still have? I posted it. It's, it's just uh, Nate Picks Tech World. All right. Make sure you guys head on over there to his channel and subscribe as well. That way you can get in on the fun early. You can be one of the first. Um, by the way, I left his first comment and his second and his third. <laughs> it was great. I am such a troll. I can't help it. It's in, it's in my nature. <laughs> hey, you want to know? People troll me. The fact that I can go troll the people, it's just me passing the buck. Anyways, if you want to find all of this stuff, all the contact information, including Nate's, eventually I'll get I'll get it added on there as well, is available at YouTube or excuse me at the linuxcast.org slash contact. Uh, there you'll find the Discord servers and uh, other places you can find all of us massed on and such things. So, if you want to support the podcast, you can do so patreon.com slash the podcast patreon.com slash the podcast. That should definitely be the URL. Patreon.com slash linuxcast. You can tell I took a week off. I totally ruined everything. Uh, anyway, anyways, there you go. That's how you can contact with us and how you can support us. Again, watch us live if you can. If not, catch us afterwards. We'll see you all next time. <laughs>